prefer if uh, we look at you? Right, we'll uh, you you can, I'm going to say, I usually have the stationary, but I'm going to have to pull it around a little bit. So you can look at me. You, yeah, look at okay. me. I'm sitting with two filmmakers and one subject of the film that has become the most talked about film at South by Southwest this year. And when Janet Pearson uh, introduced it, she said, the filmmakers are from Austin, and we don't know them, which says a little bit about the, uh, the community of filmmakers here in Austin. Uh, all small towns and large towns have those kinds of things. But she was generally surprised. I mean, that was a very innocent remark from her about how good this documentary is. So I'm going to start with the two co-directors. and I'm going to ask you to introduce yourselves, and I know that one of you teaches documentary filmmaking, and the other one I don't know what you do. So let's start with it. Uh, my name is Scott Christofferson, and I'm based here in Austin, Texas. I teach documentary film production at a small liberal arts university called St. Edwards University. Uh, and I've been here in Austin for a few years now. Um, I direct it with Brad. And this is Brad. Yeah, I'm Brad Barber, uh, and I actually teach documentary film as well, um, but I live in Utah and teach there. Where do you teach? At Brigham Young University. Yeah. Now, this film is set almost exclusively in Utah. Are all the stories that, that you tell in the film, are they all based in Utah? Yes, all the stories uh, that you see in the film are based in Utah. The, the, the cases we focus on focus on are, uh, though we also, uh, as you noticed, you know, talk about uh, Ferguson, we talk about uh, other issues like uh, the history of SWAT and the Watts riots and how it developed over the years, but the cases, the, the primary cases are Utah cases. We're talking about a documentary that uh, talks about the militarization of the police forces across the country by the, the federal government, essentially, where they're actually given uh, military equipment and then they have to use it within a certain period of time. I guess they'll take it back if they don't use it. I mean, I don't know what the real story is. So I will ask that question of our central character here who's sitting in the middle. But the film, it, it could not be more timely. I mean, I live in New York City and with, um, with the Hands Up movement and Black Lives Matter, uh, there's been a, a tremendous response uh, uh, among young people, and it's, it's young people of all colors, a very diverse uh, representation out in the streets, uh, which is very thrilling for someone my age to see people out in the streets again and not hiding behind their, their, their uh, computers. And, and, but in this film, uh, you, as I recollect, only show white people uh, that had been harassed and murdered by the police. And, when, and I wouldn't normally say white people, but I think it's really important that we don't just racialize the problem of the, of the militarization of the police and how that, that is played out in communities across the country. It is not just against one race, although we see it predominantly against one race. So I was very taken with the fact that, that, that who we see in this film, uh, am I correct that all the subjects are white? Yeah, yeah. yeah and it's also Utah. Yeah, and that's, that's part of the, probably the biggest reason is because we chose to focus on Dub and the work that he does in Utah, and Utah's a state with 1.3% African American, I'm not sure what the Latino population is, but it's overwhelmingly white. And so just the sort of the law of averages did mean that he was going to encounter more white people, but we really wanted to be sensitive to the fact that this issue does impact communities of color much more. Mm -hmm. And there's an interview with um, a few people that try to contextualize that and, yes. and bring Ferguson into the... But I'm glad that it's, it's, the storytelling is the way it is because it's really about class and poor people who have no clout with, to, to do some of the things that, that richer people of any color can do to avoid the kinds of situations that we see here. Sitting in the middle is the former sheriff, uh, whose last foray into politics was to run against Orrin Hatch for senator. Um, and I think when I spoke to him on the street after the premiere, we had a little chat about why would you run, and I said, well, I've run a couple of times too. It wasn't exactly to win, it was to raise the issues. And he agreed, he, he, he told a very funny story in the Q&A about 
Orrin Hatch had never been contested before seriously, and Orrin Hatch had spent millions of dollars to, to be reelected. And, and Dove Williams, who's sitting in the, right here, who I'm about to talk to, spent $5,000 and actually made a change in the law uh, as a result of his campaign. So, ex sheriff, um, and I, I don't want to make this light because the reason that, that you you have a nose for police work. I mean, um, that's clear in the, in the film. You're retired, uh, and you, as I understood it, uh, set up a SWAT team 30 years ago in, where you were the sheriff. Um, and 30 years later, your son-in-law was killed by a SWAT team. And the documentation, the footage that these two gentlemen have pulled together it's a remarkable expose of what goes on in a moment like that. So I've told all of that stuff, Dub, so you can talk a little bit more about how you, do, how you um, walk that path, knowing what police work is, knowing uh, that, that, that crime does happen, and yet your son-in-law, uh, because of a domestic argument, basically, as I understand it, uh, it got way out of proportion. How did that happen, and what the hell are the, are the SWAT teams doing? I, peace officer is a very good, I think it covers it from 1960s all the way to, to current. I began and when I got out of the Marine Corps and moved to Utah, married a Wyoming girl, <laughs> and uh, I got a job as a police officer. Um, I happened to move into the same neighborhood as the chief of police, and we became friends, and he actually um, asked me to submit an application. At that time, I had no idea I'd ever want to be a police officer. Mm -hmm. I was in college. I'd gotten out of the Marine Corps. Um, I did go to work as a police officer with Bountiful City, and it didn't take me long. Um, Utah is a predominantly red state. <laughs> That's where President Reagan mm -hmm. kicked off his campaign for president. That's where, uh, in Davis County, Utah, there had not been a Democrat elected in nearly half a century. So I was the first Democrat. I followed as a Democrat. I didn't even know any Democrats. But um, as fate would have it, Providence, um, Things had happened that gave me some publicity, and I worked really hard. Um, I went door to door, handed out 25,000 full color brochures, and, and with my little daughter on my back <laughs> in a backpack. And, and so I won that election. Um, I was a Democrat. You know, well, I. Yeah. <clears throat> everybody in Utah uh, yeah. is. That's, that's, pretty quite much a, that's quite a. Uh, so it was, it was a fun campaign. I like people. Um, People seem to like me. <laughs> um, Let me ask you a question. Sure. When you were a young <coughs> rookie cop, and when you became, I think at the age of 29, the sheriff, you know, probably the younger sheriff around, um, what did you see as police work? I mean, the, the title of the film is Peace Officer, which I really think is so appropriate to remind people of what the civic duty is. Uh, <laughs> but what, what, when, you, when you did become a police officer, what did you see your role? I have to give you even more background. Okay. <laughs> My father lived to be 94 years old, and he passed away last Easter. Mm -hmm. He was born and raised in Mount Airy, North Carolina, and my mother still lives in Mayberry. <laughs> so I have a, an experience, a background. A police officer was, I was taught that police officers were our friends. Uh, any police officer was there to help, and I could go to it. I trusted, uh, you know, the whole idea, Andy Griffith's image uh, that built into my brain as a as a young as a kid as a young kid, yeah. and the the police were respected and and, and your friend. loved and admired and and raised in the, around that environment. Um, the the highway patrolmen, that we, a lot of those officers we knew by first name and they knew us, you know. Um, that, that was a, a training ground for me. So when I came to work after getting out of the Marine Corps and moved to Utah and got married, and um, that job 
I just kind of brought with me what I had learned from childhood. And that little incident about uh, the issuing a citation or a ticket for parking in the movie. You know, um, some, some lady yelled, say, you're a double parker and you're not getting a ticket. <laughs> well, I, was picked, I was facing the wrong way on the wrong side of the street. <laughs> oh, my <laughs> goodness. <laughs> and so she said, if I parked that way, I'd get a ticket. So, yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, how can you argue with that? I mean... The smartest way for me to get out of a tough situation was to write myself a ticket, <laughs> and I didn't think anything about it okay. at the time, but, but a, a reporter picked that up. And the next thing I knew, it, Associated Press, United Press International, Reuters, I mean, it went worldwide, and Paul Harvey carried it in Chicago on the 12 o'clock news. It was something unique. But at the time, I didn't even think about it. I just went home, and I paid the ticket, and, and it was no big deal, but it became... Um, something important because it was unusual, uh, apparently, that a police officer would treat himself like he treated everybody else. And so if you were to research during the course of the time that I served as sheriff, I got in trouble politically. First of all, I was a Democrat in a totally Republican state and county. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, um, I cited people who were public officials. Uh, we actually cited the superintendent of the highway patrol charged him with DUI and he lost his job and uh, he fought it all the way through. So he treated court. every citizen equally. Every, everybody is under the law. I learned that the Constitution applies to everybody across the board, fair and square. Okay. We, don't, we shouldn't have inequality under the law. When were you first uh, elected sheriff? Uh, November 5th, 1974. And when did you first hear about SWAT teams? Um, I had heard about SWAT teams uh, when I was a police officer with Bountiful City. And actually, uh, Salt Lake City uh, had begun uh, something similar. You know, a, 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 they initiated it, actually, uh, probably before I did, and, and were, began the training of SWAT team uh, on a limited basis in Utah. It was for, um, and I went down to Los Angeles uh, shortly after I became uh, sheriff, and... Uh, took a good look at that because... That's right around the time of the SLA. Yeah. Uh, it was after the, the Watts riots had occurred in the yeah. 60s, and then you had the, uh, all of the, the Simeonese Liberation yeah. Army, yeah. you had Patty Hearst, yeah. and all those things were pretty... Uh, uh, all on television. Yeah, yeah, it was, yeah. It was public. And we had had two major cases there in, in Utah, in Weber County. Um, the trial was actually in my county, so as a sheriff, I was required to stand in front of the judge and take custody of two uh, men that were sentenced to be executed by a firing squad. Um, Pierre Del Selby and um, William Andrews were sentenced to death, and they were in my jail and I had custody of them, and, I, and the trial went on while I was shortly after, during the time I was mm -hmm. uh, sheriff-elect. And, so, uh, and then there was another case. Uh, I was elected on the 5th of November, and on the 8th of November, uh, Ted Bundy, uh, who became a well-known after we were able to... Um, now, you found things out about Ted Bundy that nobody else had been able to find. Am I correct on that? Well, we found a handcuff key, and we profiled him. I was on my knees with you know, 12 officers searching every square inch of the area there at Beaumont High School. You mean called Baltimore. doing your job? Yeah, we were doing a thorough investigation, and I learned from some very good investigators how to do it right. Mm -hmm. And they were thorough. And I mean, I could name you a dozen officers that were incredible. Um, they were well trained. They were expert at what they did. And uh, as and then I here I am, the chief law enforcement officer of the county, actually in the field as a newly elected official, young, and right in the middle. Uh, right there when the handcuff keys is there. And we learned that same day that Ted Bundy had tried five times and, this, the, and he finally succeeded. The first one was Carol DeRange and she escaped, one of the first known people to escape from Ted Bundy's um, strategy of abducting young girls. Mm. And so with those five attempts, we ended up with, with witnesses and one that had escaped same day. So the 8th of November, 1974, was the day that Ted Bundy made his fatal mistake. And from that point on, we weren't able to find the bodies of a lot of his victims. 
So we couldn't prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he committed murder or even a rape or that he was even committed a crime for that matter in my county. But he did abduct and rape and kill and you know, two uh, of my constituents in my county, two young girls. Mm -hmm. And so we knew that and so we began sharing and everybody began sharing with us and, you know, from Seattle to Pennsylvania to Vermont to Colorado, Florida, I mean, we, we began a nationwide, we got him just on kidnapping, and we put him in prison for one to 15 years. You know, the, uh, what I'm interested in, in understanding is how you moved from the sort of peace officer to the position of wanting to bring into your county or your area a SWAT team, because what kind of crime uh, what what would be the reason that one would want to have a SWAT team and define what a SWAT team actually is? Okay, the original concept was training, um, negotiation tactics, um, diffusing, uh, neutralizing, uh, having the the firepower, the advantage. Uh, you know, if a, if a burglar's got a shotgun and you got a thirty-eight pistol, you're at a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. So, in from the standpoint of um, training, um, diffusing, neutralizing, um, having superior tactical capability, <clears throat> it basically came from my Marine Corps training. Okay, um, but let me ask you a question. Um, were they ever conceptually supposed to operate above the law? Never. In the way that we see them today, operating. I actually abolished the, the $82,000 grant uh, that provided for a, a drug task force in our community because the strings attached to the federal government. Um, and it, it was a combination of three cities contributed an officer, and the sheriff's office contributed two. Mm -hmm. So it was a five member task force, drug task force. Mm -hmm. And they worked undercover. And the thing that I, I found very difficult to deal with was police officers were beginning to violate the law that they were enforcing. I felt that it was, and the main reason for abolishing it was because officers could buy drugs, they could sell drugs, they could use drugs, and yet they arrest, they'd work for six mm -hmm. months and then they'd blow their cover when they went to court and testify, mm -hmm. but they'd arrest 60 people. Okay, so, so, <clears throat> so uh, equality under the law yeah. was probably the main focus there. All right, so, so now we know who you are, you know, and then you serve for a number of years. You either don't get elected or you stop being the sheriff, whatever the reason is. And, and then let's move to, this, to what happened with your son-in-law. September 22nd, 2008, um, domestic argument, and uh, Brian picked up the phone and called 911, and uh, he said, I just beat and raped my wife. Come get me. But the buildup had been probably six months because they lived right across the street from the police department. He was a fireman. Really? Uh, he never had been in trouble, uh, never been, no felonies, no misdemeanors, not even a traffic ticket. Mm -hmm. And so here's a clean fireman mm -hmm. person. Um, and the incident, I don't know why they had to bring in a SWAT team. Uh, they initially, by noon that day, there was over 100 officers there, um, 46 SWAT officers, completely surrounded, completely contained, mm -hmm. and there were a dozen different ways that they could have neutralized that uh, situation when nobody hurt. They may have hurt him a little. I mean, they may have nailed him with some bean bags or, you know, or soft, you know, bullets. But so you could have, that could have been neutralized, and they didn't. They used it as a, these officers, these the, the, this overwhelming. Uh, army of police arrived at a house basically with a domestic problem. Um, and I'm going to bring the filmmakers back into the, into the picture. When did you, I mean, how did you find Dub? How did you find this story? How did you s decide that this storytelling was important and that you wanted to work on it? Yeah, so uh, uh uh, Dub was at a softball game um, uh, that I was playing in, and he knew that I, uh, he happened to be there and, and knew that I was a documentary film professor, and he said, hey, would you teach me how to edit? Okay, and so he's, he's seeking help in getting the story documented. 
and he's done his homework, and he realizes that there's this softball player also is a documentary filmmaker. filmmaker. Is that correct? <laughs> I think he knows how to edit it. He's got this investigative nose. It was, <laughs> it was serendipitous and, and coincidental somewhat, but, you know, af after that, we... I went over to his hangar. I saw that he had created this two-hour-long uh, film where he had... Was, I, I kind of call it a police chief's analysis of, of his son-in-law's story, and he had meticulously picked it apart. And I thought, wow, this is a really compelling story, you know, and Dub is a really compelling character. It wasn't, oh, let's let's make a film about this issue. Mm -hmm. It was, Dub's fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, his story is fascinating. His son-in-law's story is fascinating. You know, the, the fact that he started a SWAT team and then that SWAT team killed his son-in-law. That was, you know, that was a story mm -hmm. worth telling. Um, and... And then Brad and I, you know, we were working together on another project, and we kind of, I kind of ran it by him, and he said, "Yeah, that sounds amazing." And and we both decided that, okay, we're going to start start shooting this. And we didn't know what it would what it would become. We didn't know if it would be a short film or a feature length film, but we were we were really fascinated with Dub um, and his story. So in the in the two hour film that that. that Dub had made, was the footage that we see of the actual police action at his son-in-law's home, was that in that? I mean, where'd you get access sure, right. to those? How did you get, I mean, those are, that's harder me, than hell to get a hold of. It took me two years and seven months to get that footage. <laughs> it, uh, we used grammar requests, Freedom of Information Act, every IOU, every friend, every connection, every paralegal, every lawyer, every everybody that would that was willing to help us in one way or another to get access to what we tried to get. Um, and two, um, there is a law. I mean, it, uh, it's a Government Records Access Management Act in Utah, uh, Freedom of Information Act. We're entitled to that. You know, we, the, pip, the public has a right to those records. Mm -hmm. and, and it was hard. It was hard. And some of the records we got, the archives people even told me personally that nobody had ever really requested everything. Mm -hmm. And I had some connections. Um, mm -hmm. There was some lawyers that, I mean, a lawyer that sent a memo down to the, the, the commander of the task force, uh, the strike force, and uh, with a directive. And he called me and wanted to know what I wanted to do, what I wanted these records for. Mm -hmm. And then he had to send a memo down to archives and have the lady who um, was in charge. Uh, so you got them. So you, I ended you up finally, like two and a half years later, 13, you got them. Docu 13 discs with eight dash cameras. Well, and all what's interesting to me is at this point of the storytelling, you go to the cops. You know, you get the cops. I mean, there's an, a, a, any good documentary. Uh, tries to give both more than one point of view. It's not a, it may be an advocacy documentary, but it's not, you know, a propaganda. Uh, and so you go to the cops, some of whom dub you, I would assume you knew, or, or they, uh, and you got to interview their, hear their side of the story, which, how did that happen? Yeah, so we, um, with the police officers, we had, uh, I'd set up meetings with them. I, I met with one of the commanders. I took him out to lunch, who was part of the Weber, Nar Weber Morgan Narcotics Strike Force, and, and told him about our, our film and said, you know, we really want to put the audience in the shoes of police officers. We want to know what it's like. We want to know, we want to empathize with you and know, know what the experience mm -hmm. is like uh, to go in on a raid and know what it's like to put your life on the line. And then after that, we met with the police officers in the Matthew David Stewart raid and, and, um, and, said this is what we're doing and then two out of the 12 officers who were in on that raid said okay we'll do it we'll 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 share our opinion i think it took a lot of courage on their part to to open up and and talk about it and then along the way we but they felt they were in the right right yeah yeah i mean they they got a warrant uh right in their opinion right they 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 um they were carrying out their orders they they got a tip that there was someone was growing marijuana and that uh, we need to read this home because we got a warrant and they, they were doing a job. At what point did the other stories become part of this story? Because Dub's son-in-law story is a very central story that you're telling. But you bring in how many other stories in Utah? There's the Mike Stewart's uh, son, uh, Matthew Stewart. There's uh, Melissa Kennedy's daughter, Danielle Willard. 
And there's a, also a family that we feature. Fortunately, nobody was shot or killed, but it's still a really important story that um, Eric Hill and his family uh, had the SWAT team raid his home um, with a mistaken identity. They mistaken home, else. absolute destruction. They go in. All of this is, it, you have footage of all of this. It's just and, and the Todd Blair case was quite... Uh, right, right. And Todd Blair also, who was uh, the gentleman who held up golf. A, a golf club and, and was shot and killed. Yeah. Now, one of the things that, and correct me if I don't if I remember correctly, is that a number of the people said, we didn't know who was coming in. They didn't look like police officers. They didn't identify them. But they lo looked like some, like some paramilitary force. Am I correct that that's the way the SWAT team dresses and goes in? I think it, 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 you, you can answer that as well, because I think you, you, know, you obviously know better than me. I would, I would just say... I think it depends on the SWAT team. Um, you know, uh, you know, most most often, and Dub, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. It seems like they, they nowadays they wear tactical gear, but on some of the raids, you know, like in the Matthew David Stewart raid, they were wearing undercover cop clothes. They were, they were not all of them were wearing vests. Some of them were, some of them weren't. Um, you know, I would like to talk to you for about an hour, but but I can't because there are other people that need to talk to you. But I, there's a couple more things I want to go over before we, um, we finish here. Uh, I just want to say that to, to the to people that watch this, uh, you're getting a little idea of how complicated this story is. The most shocking part for me is when the police officers say one thing, and then you see the footage of what actually happened, which absolutely contradicts what they said. Dove, do you think that they believe what they're saying, or do they know that they're lying? That's a tough question. Very, very tough question. I don't want to answer it, but evidence. Um, what I've discovered is that police officers not only, I mean, I'm, this is not uh, every police department, it's not every administrator, but over time, officers have trained to win cases in court. It's an adversarial system. Uh, prosecution has a vested interest in winning and protecting the county. The prosecutor makes that decision. He's also responsible for, um, uh, <clears throat> there's two terms. Uh, um, I'm drawing a blank. Um, damage control and um, Damage control, damage control when someone's been killed. Damage control. Damage control by a public servant. Yeah, really. For the county. And um, what's the other term that I'm looking for? Um, preventative. Um, risk management. Yeah. Risk management. If, if a, an agency is found guilty, there's usually a monetary settlement there. And so <clears throat> what we have, instead of due process, and the evidence being presented in the trial, we have evolved into a system where that due process is no longer there. A uh, county attorney or prosecutor also has a discretionary power to decide whether or not the officer acted within the scope of the law. And so the law protects the officers and lobbyists have got those laws in place. In, in, the, in the Ferguson case, for example, or the, or the case in Staten Island, where it went to the grand jury and the grand jury said there was no crime committed. And I believe you said at, 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 in the Q&A after the film, that is the law that allows this to happen. And, and I'd like you to talk a little bit about that and, how, and what we can do about it, because the, the distrust among young people and older people of the police departments around the country is at, at a point where it's never been before. And how do we pull it back to the peace officer and not the killer cop? Okay, this is a misconception, a misunderstanding by most, honestly, most of the citizens of the United States. When a, when a prosecuting attorney makes a decision that this was justified or not justified, what he's saying is that it's not guilt or innocence. It's under the law, within the scope of the law, understanding that the officer has governmental immunity, he is protected by laws that are in place where if he feels threatened, if his life is placed in danger, or he perceives 
that his life is in danger or the safety of someone else is placed in danger, then under the law, he is exonerated because he's, he qualifies for immunity. And if you have immunity under the law, you can't use any of that evidence in court, so the, the prosecuting attorney and the judges have to rule within the scope of the law. And that's where I've run uh, into a little bit of conflict with some of the people I've helped because they don't understand <coughs> that it's not right or wrong, it's not guilt or innocence, it's did the conduct come within the scope of the existing law. Mm -hmm. So to give a certain segment of our society immunity Mm -hmm. So this officer above the law, above the law, it's and they like can lie I, and get away with it's it. It's like what I did back in the, the drug cases in the '70s, mm -hmm. where you can't buy drugs and sell drugs and use drugs, and you go free mm -hmm. and don't get prosecuted, and the people that did it with you go to prison or go to jail. It's the same thing today. It's it's the same concept. What's the solution in your mind? The loose solution mm -hmm. is more accountability more transparency, more equality under the law, and get rid of that governmental immunity statute. I so mean, changing the, the law. You have to have immunity. Yeah. I mean, the state is all-powerful. Mm -hmm. The state has to have the power to take okay. even life in certain circumstances. Mm -hmm. So that's the most powerful thing on, on the planet. But there's checks and balances. Right now we're out of balance. Okay. Right now we have, our system is broken. We need to make some corrections. And there's ways to do it within the scope of the law without looting or burning or creating other victims. You're, tra you're talking about citizen action and people holding accountable their elected officials. And if they're not accountable, then changing them is, am I, exactly. rather than other kinds of things. Multifaceted approach. You've got to educate people. You've got to train them in the law. You've got to explain what the law is. Mm -hmm. You've got to create a an environment that it was originally meant to be when this country was founded. We used to be the greatest country on earth, you know, mm -hmm. and it was because of that respect for equality under the law. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's not, we don't have it yet. You know, we don't have equality under the law. We need to do that. We really do need well, to do I that. I want to finish with asking the filmmakers a couple of questions. Um, how long did you work on the film? So we, uh, we started this film in summer of 2012, so it's been a little over two and a half years. Okay, so, so when the Trayvon Martin case happened, did you connect it to what you were doing with your film? I'm not sure that's something we talked about specifically. Um, no, I don't know. We, we were aware of it, but <clears throat> I don't remember that coming into uh, talks when we first started. So at what stage did you realize that the film that you were working on, which was very specific, became a national issue? Um, and, that, and, this is, and this is what this, your film was, would be seen in that way as a comment on something that wasn't just Utah-based, was happening all over the country. Yeah, I think it's safe to say that you know, Ferguson, seeing Ferguson happen really... Uh, echoed what we had seen in Utah, you know, like that this, that this militarization of police, that these things were happening everywhere. I think that really uh, um, brought our, our film into the light, so to speak, you know, made it, made it more national. Uh, I'm trying to remember if there's something before that or if that was kind of the main, main thing, Brad, what do you think? That's what I think of too as the real kind of high watermark of, of national dialogue and, and interest that made it clear the connections that, uh, you know, Dub is always, we've sort of seen him as a microcosm for these bigger uh, issues, and, and yeah, a lot of those issues are, are being talked about a lot more now. I'm going to close with asking Dub a question. Should this not be a discussion that is above partisan politics, and yet it seems to be divided uh, between uh, Republicans and Democrats, <coughs> as, uh, and how, and if you agree that that's the situation, how do we, I think your film will, will help raise that, that question very well, but how do we get that conversation going? That both sides can understand that, that it's in the best interest of, of, the, of the United States to deal with this question. I've actually wrestled with this for more than 30 years, since 1982, however long that is. Mm -hmm. 
we actually took the best law we ever had on our books out of the law in Utah. It was a constitutional amendment, Article 6, Section 23. I spent 30 What did it say? It says, any bill passed by the House or Senate must contain only one subject and be clearly identified by its title. To me, that's the starting place. In 2013, after the race with Orrin Hatch, my 5,000 bucks was spent pushing that agenda, that issue. And Representative Craig Powell from Heber, Utah, sponsored that um, referendum, that uh, ballot issue, I mean, that uh, um, legislative issue. And it was reinstated in our state constitution in, in the beginning of the legislative session in 2013 after the 2012 campaign. I recall getting standing ovations with that proposal because it was, it was so impacting and it's so important. It would, it would take away the, the influence of lobbyists in that any bill that they sponsored would have to stand on its own merits it would eliminate all the writers, the, the, all of the um, amendments that are attached to otherwise good bills in Washington. It would make uh, off, uh, legislators accountable. It would do a lot of the things that, that we would try to, we're trying to do with the film, Peace Officer. Uh, to me, that's a starting place. I was very, very hurt. I was very disappointed, and I was on the legislative committee and fought other uh, sheriffs and chiefs of police back in the 1980s where that was taken out of our Constitution and it should never have happened. You and know? you got it put back. Put it back. Okay. We got it back in Utah. I want it in Washington okay. because accountability, you know, transparency, uh, equality, uh, every, all of that is important Did and it won't hurt anybody. It's not partisan. Yeah. It's perfect yeah. okay. as a starting place. That's where we start. If we can do that in Washington, I don't care if it's a, if it's a, 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 a whether it's a, it's a. I mean, so they can't slip in these little little hidden no, things that then divide everybody. Write a bill, and if it stands on its own merits, if it's a good law, pass it. You well, can read it at least. <laughs> well, I think thank you for that citizen action sort of challenge that you put out, and I want to thank both of the filmmakers. I, I must tell you that not since Citizen Four have I been so engaged with a critique that comes from a, a patriotic place. You know, uh, you may not agree with me about Citizen Four, but I think that Edward Snowden is a patriot, you know, and I think that what you have done in this film is really say, talk to the citizenry of, 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 of the United States about, this is what's happening, do you agree? I mean, the audience has to go out of, I came out of there thinking, how do I feel about this, and what can I do to, besides yelling about it, you know? What can I do? So you want to say anything in closing? Uh, well, <clears throat> thank you for, for uh, having us and also for saying, saying that. And I, and I think, you know, for us, one of, our, one of the goals in, in the film or for making the film is to, uh, you know, it's not, to, it's not an agenda film. Um, I, I think it's to create a dialogue, right? Create discussion and hopefully find a way to, if it means changing laws, find a way to protect both officers and citizens so that, so that both can be safe, right? Both that, that they don't have to unnecessarily put their lives on the line uh, to carry out certain laws uh, so that both can be protected. I think that's, that's something that, that I would love to see, a more peaceful approach to, to um, protecting citizens. And so you don't see it as an anti-police in general, you see it as, as a way of making, bringing respect back to what it means to be a peace officer. Absolutely. Yeah. And then, I mean, and Dub's a great example of that. He's, you know, in many ways, is the police still. He loves law enforcement. And uh, thank you for your kind words. I'm glad you pointed out the left and right thing, because I, I think people that watch this, and certainly people that are in the film, come from very different places politically, but this is an area where there's a lot of agreement. I was sitting next to a cop's wife at the screening, and she was very engaged in the film. Okay, thank you very much.